Hello and welcome everyone to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences live video call from a dinosaur dig. It's good to be with you all again for another update from our paleontology team who are out west doing the dirty work of digging up dinosaurs and exploring ancient history right now. Uh, today I am broadcasting to you from the Windows on the World classroom inside the Museum of Natural Sciences. And I happen to have a fabulous museum audience. Everybody wave, say hello. It's great to be with you all in person and online. Uh, that means that for today's program, if you're watching with us on YouTube or on Facebook, taking in our presentation, you can ask your questions via the chat box or the comments thread on YouTube and Facebook. I've got both of those places pulled up so that I can see your thoughts, your comments, and your questions for today's guest paleontologist. And if you happen to be with me here in the room at the museum, you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions too directly to Dr. Lindsay Zano. You'll just have to, you know, like maybe wave at me a little bit. That way I can call on you and you can come up, get close to the microphone so that Lindsay can hear you. So without further ado, Everybody, the museum's paleontology team has been out west in New Mexico, Utah, and Montana looking for dinosaurs uh, for the last, well, at this point, for the last few months. And the person in charge of that entire effort is Dr. Lindsay Zano, the head of paleontology here at the museum and professor at North Carolina State University. Hey, Lindsay, how's it going? Hey, Chris, how's everything back in Raleigh? So things look pretty uh, gorgeous out there at the West. Where are you right now? Oh, we are in the middle of nowhere in central Utah. Um, the weather's beautiful. It's a little bit windy today, but um, we've had some pretty good, nice, warm, gentle breeze days, not a lot of rain. Overall, it's been pretty spectacular. Yeah, that's a really beautiful scene that you've got there behind you. Yeah, the vista behind me, I sort of set up so you could see the, the Badlands back there. That's the famous uh, Jurassic, late Jurassic Morrison formation, where a lot of dinosaurs that everyone knows and loves come from, Stegosaurus and other things. We're not actually digging in those Badlands, but they're right next to where our Cretaceous quarries are, which are more off this way to my left. Okay, exciting. So, uh... Tell us, how's the field season been so far? Field season's been great. I mean, I've certainly loved checking in with you guys since May. We've been out, I think, like you said, it's been several months. I think this is week 14 for the team. So we're all kind of, we have no idea what day it is or what's going on in, in the news back home anymore. But uh, we've had a pretty spectacular field season. We're um, Wrapping up our last two weeks, we have two more weeks here in Utah in this one field area, and then the field team will move to Montana for uh, three, three and a half weeks. So it's uh, it's a long field season for us, about 19 weeks, about four, four and a half months. Uh, but we're getting a lot done. We're finding a lot of new species. We're getting ready to bring a lot of cool stuff back to the museum. Oh, very exciting. Well, I mean, <laughs> that means my next question has to be, what kind of cool stuff are you finding here right now? Yeah, so so where we are right now, this is a, a rock formation we call the Muss and Touch It. And it's uh, rocks that date to the very, very beginning of the late Cretaceous. So about 99 million years ago or so. We've been working out in this specific area now for about 14 years. So we come here every year. It's a wonderful place to, to dig fossils and find new dinosaurs. And you'd think in 14 years, we'd have found all the dinosaurs there are to find here. But actually last year, we found uh, a brand new species of dinosaur just around the corner from me, uh, a very early horn dinosaur, Ceratopsian dinosaur. Um, and it's a very rare animal in these rocks. And so we were so super excited to come out here this year and see if we could find more of the skeleton. And uh, we dug a really, really big hole, 30 foot hole in the back of this hill near me. And we've been finding a few bits and pieces, not as many as we hope so far, uh, like an upper jawbone and some teeth and maybe some limb elements and a couple tailbones. 
Um, but we're still hopeful. We'll still have two more weeks to move some rock and hopefully find some more pieces of this really cool new species. Very exciting. So you found this, you said it's a new ceratopsia, a new foreign dinosaur. How do you know, like so early in the process, or maybe guess that you've got a new species? Well, last year when we when I found the site, we were able to collect a few pieces from the surface. So when we find a site out here, we can't open a big quarry. We have to go through a bunch of permission processes and get a bunch of permits to open a big 30 foot hole in the ground, as you can imagine. But we're allowed to collect a little bit from the surface. And so we collected a few bones from the surface last year, including a cheekbone right here. Uh, it was very, very useful for determining what kind of dinosaur we actually had and helped us know to put in an excavation permit and to, to open a really big hole and look for the rest of it this year. Okay, fascinating, fascinating. So tell us a little bit then about uh, the process of, you know, prospecting and beginning to find out where the dinosaurs are buried and then actually uncovering them and eventually getting them here to the museum. So you can kind of see behind me in these badlands I was talking about that there's very little plant life out here. It's very, very dry, arid desert. So we can see the, the rocks on the ground without you know plants covering the view. And the way that we find dinosaurs out here is, is very simple. It's not very fancy. We just, we just go out and we walk around on these hillsides looking for places where bone is actually just eroding out of the ground. Uh, luckily, here in the Muss and Touch It, the rocks are gray um, and the bone is shiny black. So it's usually pretty easy to spot bone eroding out of the hillside. And that's kind of the easy part. Then the hard part is knowing uh, how much might be in the hill. Is it worth opening a huge hole and spending weeks with a team, you know, trying to find these bone layers? And that can be a real challenge. Um, but what we end up doing is sort of tracing those fragments up the hill till we sort of find the layer we think the bone is coming from. And then we have to take all the rock on top off so that we have a nice flat surface to open a quarry. And then we spend weeks just slowly with tiny tools kind of removing that rock to try and get all those bones wrapped in plaster and brought back to the museum. It sounds like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. This one quarry took us about a week with a very large team just picking and shoveling for about a week straight. So it was, it was a lot of work to move 30 feet of overburden. Um, you know, if your hill is very, very steep, every time you want to go in a foot, you have to go up down four feet. And so you end up having to make a huge back wall just to get a couple of meters of actual bone bearing layer to work on. So uh, who's on the team there with you? How many people are there to help chip and chisel away? Well, uh, early on in the season, we had a class from NC State. So I teach a class of for undergraduates for them to come out and learn about paleontology and how to do field work. So we had about six uh, students from NC State that were out that were doing their undergraduate degree. They've gone home. They were only here for two weeks. Uh, so the core team right now is um, graduate students who are resident graduate students of the lab. They work with me in the lab on the third floor of the NEC, uh, NRC, excuse me. And um, we have some visiting postdocs and visiting grad students. We have a postdoc here uh, who's working in Spain, who's here to get some experience and collaborate with us. And then we have team geologists who work with us to help us put our fossils in context. So we don't just want to dig the dinosaurs up. We want to know how old they are. We want to know what the climate was like and the environment was like. And so we bring other scientists onto the team to help us sort of flesh out the whole picture of the dinosaur ecosystem and really understand what, what was going on here. 99 million years ago. That's amazing. So uh, I'm going to turn to the audience and I'll remind people who are watching online, you can ask questions too. type them up into the chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. But uh, I do have an audience question here at the museum. So uh, do you want to come up and ask Dr. Zano? Yeah, come on up. Yay, they're giving a great big round of applause. <laughs> Take a step back. Perfect. What's your question? What's the, like, what's the biggest dinosaur you've found yet? 
What's the biggest dinosaur you found, Lindsay? Um, the biggest dinosaur I found was Siach, which was probably a 30 foot long uh, carnivore, a theropod dinosaur, which uh, we dug up from a quarry that's about seven miles from where I'm sitting very, very early on. It was something we found in the first week of our first field season back in 2008. And uh, actually, we haven't found many more pieces of it since, just a, a couple of bones here and there. So that's one of the things that's interesting about this place is some of the dinosaurs are very common. We find them everywhere, like certain kinds of duckbill dinosaurs and other ones like this new horn dinosaur and this predator, Siach, this 30 foot long predator. We've only found it one quarry in over a decade. So they can be very rare. And so we keep coming back to see maybe we'll stumble on that brand new species in a new site next year. Oh, yeah. How exciting would it be to find some more of that uh, big predator, Siach? Oh, we would love that because there's a lot of questions about uh, who Siach's closest relatives were because we only found parts of the spine and leg and hip. Um, and so it would be really wonderful to have more pieces of the skeleton so we could better place it on the dinosaur family tree. That would be exciting. All right. Another audience question for me. Come on up. Hi. Um, uh, when these dinosaurs were alive, where on the earth would they have lived in relative to where the continents and stuff are now? Right. They were a little bit further south. Um, you know, the whole continent was a little bit further south than when it is right now. But Maybe the more interesting thing is that right now, obviously, this is a very dry desert. But back when these dinosaurs were living here at the beginning of the late Cretaceous, this was a swamp. It was kind of like the Mississippi Delta. So you had uh, very high humidity and high temperatures and tons of plants and swampy bogs. And uh, it's kind of like, and in some ways, kind of like some parts of coastal North Carolina where you guys are right now. And that's because there was a huge ocean that ran right next to this, that ran right down the middle of North America at the time. And so this was a coastal environment that was teeming with dinosaurs and plants and other forms of life back then. So very different place than it is now. Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, Others in the room, let me know. Lindsay, uh, how much longer will you be out in the field this year? Uh, I will be here in Utah another two weeks. And then when the team goes to Montana, I'm coming back to organize an expedition to Mongolia. So we'll have sort of the paleo unit. We'll have two simultaneous expeditions going on, one in Montana, one in Mongolia at the same time throughout September. And then we'll be done for the year because it gets cold in the desert, actually, and snows uh, by October. And so we kind of have to wrap things up by October every year. Wow. So you're you're going to be going from the West out to Mongolia to look for dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah. For find, a month. Yeah. Is that to find different kinds of dinosaurs, the same ones? Well, so one of the really fascinating things about the must and touch it dinosaurs um, is that they are very influenced by Asian dinosaurs. And so at this time in North America, a land bridge actually formed between North America and Asia across Alaska and through Russia and down into China and other areas of Asia. And so one of the reasons we're out here digging up these new dinosaurs, not just to name species, but to understand how those dinosaurs were moving between Asia and North America at this time and how that influenced dinosaur evolution. So we're uh, both working here and now this will be our first expedition year that we've been trying to get going during the pandemic, but this will be the first year we get over there to Mongolia to rocks that are the same age. And so we want to compare what kinds of dinosaurs were living there and here and try and better understand how they were moving back and forth between Asia and North America at the time. That's so interesting. Okay, let me get some questions from the internet for you. The first one that I've got for you comes from a six-year-old viewer who writes, where is the closest paleontology site to North Carolina? 
Oh, well, there are lots of paleontology sites in North Carolina. Um, North Carolina is very famous for having an incredible record of Triassic fossils. So there weren't a ton of dinosaurs in North America during the Triassic. Dinosaurs were kind of just getting started, but there were a lot of other kinds of cool animals. And, and I think the museum, Chris, has a big exhibit uh, that's on right now talking about dinosaurs and other kinds of cool animals that were alive closer to that time. There are uh, really amazing fossils that come right from the Raleigh Durham area from clay pits where they make bricks that are about um, about that age. So very close. <laughs> very close, yeah. Very right close. In the back door, right in our backyard. Yeah. Yeah, we do have uh, the featured exhibition on right now, Permian Monsters, which is about life before, it's called Life Before Dinosaurs. Folks here in the room, if you haven't seen it yet, go check it out, it's a lot of fun. Okay, next question for you, Lindsay. Uh, what is the smallest dinosaur you found? <laughs> what is this? Well, so I mentioned that we have a, a horn dinosaur, a new species of ceratopsy and a horn dinosaur that we're digging up. We also have a really spectacular quarry that we're working at the same time. We're actually working three quarries right now. And one of them contains all kinds of tiny animals. So they're not only um, bones from raptor dinosaurs, which we're really excited about because we haven't been able to get enough material to name any of the raptor dinosaurs yet. Um, tiny little millimeter sized bones of lizards and mammals and other kinds of things that are coming from this one locality. Um, so I would say that the tiniest fossils I've dug up are, they're microscopic in size, but they tell us about all the little animals that are living in the environment. Wow, so very, very small. All right, let's see. Next question is going to come from the room. Come on up. All right, what's your question? How, how many dinosaur species have you found so far? How many dinosaur species have you found so far, Lindsay? Uh oh. Not sure what's going on. Did I lose Lindsay. Don't worry, we'll be back in a moment with Dr. Lindsay Zano. Got my hey, screen. Chris. <laughs> Got your screen figured out, although you're uh, you're sideways on us. <laughs> my uh, my fancy antenna blew over in the wind. The fun of skyping live from the field. Let me see. Oh sure. Fix that. Yeah, this is the fun of the. Uh, doing live television, everybody, from the desert yeah. of nowhere American West. <laughs> okay, I think we're good for the moment. So I know you had a question from the audience. Yes, let's take that question again. Do you remember your question? Let's try again. How many dinosaur species have you had have you found so far? How many dinosaurs? Oh, goodness. Are? Well, I don't know the exact number, but I've, I've been fortunate to be able to name dinosaurs from different groups. So different kinds of raptor dinosaurs like troodonids and oviraptors, which are feathered theropod dinosaurs. 
things like siatch. I also worked on some dinosaurs called therizinosaurs, which are very near and dear to me because they're raptor dinosaurs basically, but they ate plants. And so they're a really, really interesting group of dinosaurs. Um, I'm working on some um, small plant eating dinosaurs now, describing a new species of um, sort of Iguanodontian, if you know what that is. Uh, it's kind of like an early duck bill dinosaur. And so it's been fun to kind of, each time we find a new species, I get to learn about a new group of dinosaurs and really dig into their evolutionary history and their anatomy. And that's one of the fun things about being a field paleontologist is, you know, you never really know what you're going to be working on. It's all about what you discover while you're out here and what you find. I didn't think I would be working on a horned dinosaur because that's not something I've done yet, but now we have one. And so I have to come back to the museum and learn much more about horned dinosaurs and work on naming that one. So that's uh, that's one of the best parts for me about being a scientist is it's very discovery based. You know, we never know what we're going to find. And that kind of dictates the science that we do when we get back home. I guess also fortunate that you have a horned dinosaur expert on the team now. We do. We have a wonderful horned dinosaur expert, um, Eric Lund, who works in the lab. And so I, it'll be fun for us to collaborate, too, because we haven't been able to work together on a paper yet. So that, that'll be a good time. Yeah, that will be great. All right. Another one from the crowd. Um, what have, or have most of the dinosaurs that you've been finding dying of, like, old age or of... Um, maybe that they've been like hunted or what have you found them? What has happened to them when you found them? Well, that's a very difficult question for us to answer. Um, it's very hard to know how a dinosaur died because none of the soft tissue is preserved. So we can't tell usually if it was, you know, attacked or if, if it had a, a disease that was in its soft tissues. Um, it can be very, very difficult to figure out how they died. Um, and if even if you have things like um, bite marks on the bones, for example, you don't know if it was attacked or if it was just eaten after it was dead. Um, so there are some questions that are very difficult to answer with with fossil material, and that's one of them. We do have a very interesting site. So now I'm getting to the third site that we haven't talked about yet that we're working this year. That's a duckbill dinosaur that's buried in a volcanic ash. Um, and so this has been really, really fascinating for us in that uh, we have this volcanic ash layer and we have this these bones of this duckbill dinosaur and then we have more ash on top of it. So it's kind of like embedded in this volcanic ash. But it's not it's not like a uh, it got killed by the ash or it was a carcass when it was buried because the bones are kind of shifted around. And so it's a really neat story that um, we've been collecting a lot of different kinds of data to try and figure out how did this duckbill dinosaur end up in this three foot ash layer, but it's also all broken apart into pieces. And, you know, what was the story that day back in the Cretaceous that led to it getting buried there? Um, and that's a branch of, of paleontology called taphonomy, which is about, you know, what happened to the animal after it died and its bones got buried and before the scientists dig them up. Um, and so we hope to be able to write a paper about that that scenario and what happened to that particular dinosaur. But we may not ever know what killed it and how exactly it died in the first place. Great question. All right, here's another one from the chat for you. Uh, when digging, do you ever break the bones? And what do you do when it happens? Oh, yes. We break the bones all the time. <laughs> We have, uh, what you do is you piece them back together as best you can. What, what we bring with us is um, is basically a, a kind of resin that's melted in acetone. It's dissolved in acetone. Um, and so it's like a liquid hardener. And we have little bottles of it. And so when we first uncover a bone, we, we squirt this acetone-based consolidant on the bone. And it soaks into the bone pieces. And then the acetone evaporates away and leaves that um, consolidant behind holding everything together. Um, and so if we, you know, break something apart, we sort of collect all the pieces and we consolidate it to try and keep keep it in intact. Um, but yeah, that's just part of the process of, of excavating is sometimes you you break something and you put it back together. 
We got the glue ready for the job. Uh, what is the oldest mammal you've discovered? Oh, oh, probably here. I mean, I don't work on mammals. Um, paleontologists will usually like separate into different um, animal groups and specialize in those groups. Sometimes we'll work on, you know, across different groups, but mammalian paleontologists are usually kind of doing their own mammal thing and dinosaur people are doing their own dinosaur thing. But uh, we do find mammal fossils here. And they're very, very tiny. They come out when we um, collect from these micro sites that I was talking about. We find their teeth and sometimes um, jaws and other bits of bones from early mammals that come out of our, our dinosaur sites. And then I don't work on those. I get a, a mammal expert and I invite them to collaborate with me if they want to work on, on the mammals that we dig up. I guess that's the great thing about doing this work as part of a museum is that those things can come back here, they become a part of the collection of the museum, and then the mammal experts or anyone interested uh, in studying them can visit the museum or get access to those fossils and specimens and be able to use them for their research. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Chris. That's why museum collections are so important. I mean, when we're out here, we're not just collecting the dinosaurs. Uh, two days ago, I was at a plant site we were collecting clams and plant fossils. And, you know, we collect all these bones from lizards and snakes and mammals and birds and turtles. And we bring them to the museum. We conserve them. We put them in the collections. And then scientists come from all over the world to study the things that we've brought back to the museum. All right, another one from three-year-old Charlotte. How did you become a paleontologist? How did I become a paleontologist? I kind of stumbled into it a little bit. I um, I moved out west to go to college and I volunteered at the museum and I started going out with the team and just getting some experience in paleontology and fell in love with it. And, and the rest is kind of history. Then I went to grad school myself and got my degrees and got trained up to do paleontology as a science. And now I help other students who want to become paleontologists, come in the field and, and learn how to be scientists and do field work uh, at NC State. What were those degrees in your college, graduate, and uh, doctoral programs? Um, so usually paleontologists will have a degree in geology or biology or both. A lot of us have degrees that span those two disciplines because we have to understand the biology of the animals, but we have to understand the rocks that they come out of um, because it's a very important part of paleontology is understanding the environments that the dinosaurs lived in and that the bones you're excavating come from. Um, so if you want to pursue paleontology as a career, you should look at taking coursework in across the geological and the biological sciences. You have to be well-versed in both disciplines. Excellent. Thank you. And looking at the clock, I've got uh, one more question here for you. Uh, another young eight-year-old wants to know if you've found a Carnotosaurus. Carnot Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus? Carnotaurus? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Carnotaurus didn't. Well, we haven't found any bones of Carnotaurus here in North America. Um so we haven't found any Carnotaurus here, but I, I think Carnotaurus is a pretty cool dinosaur, so. Okay, there's another one in the room. You're welcome to come on down. I feel like just about everyone here probably has a favorite dinosaur. So what's your favorite dinosaur? Oh, uh, whatever I'm working on at the moment is usually my favorite dinosaur. Um, so right now, I guess my favorite dinosaur is the, that one I'm naming that is a little um, early duckbill dinosaur. It's, it's, for me, it's about learning about the dinosaur and really digging in. And whenever you're working on describing a new animal, and you're figuring out where it fits on the family tree and what its anatomy looked like, you kind of get a little obsessed with that one animal you're working on. So, um, so it's whatever I'm working on at the time, I would say. How do you pick between all your favorite children? Right. <laughs> Come on down. Thanks. 
Charlotte, and so my question has to be, um, A, have you worked here, and B, have you, what would the lifestyle be from back then? What would it look like? Chris, can you repeat that? No, I didn't catch it. Can you repeat it for me? I'm wondering, what would life be back then? What, what, like, what, what dinosaurs would kind of roam there? What, it, what dinosaurs roam in North Carolina? What dinosaurs did we have uh, in North Carolina? Yeah, well, it depends on what time period you're talking about, right? Dinosaurs, uh, well, dinosaurs are still alive. So they've been around for 240 million years. Obviously, the ones that, well, if we take birds away, you know, they were around for a very, very long time. And the types of dinosaurs that would have lived in North Carolina changed, whether you're talking about dinosaurs of the Triassic or Jurassic or early or late Cretaceous. So we do have dinosaurs uh, dinosaur fossils from North Carolina, some of which are at our museum, and most of those fossils are um, tyrannosaurs and duckbill dinosaurs and things like that. So your basic kind of late Cretaceous dinosaur ecosystem with duckbills and horned dinosaurs and tyrannosaurs and raptors uh, all would have lived in North Carolina. Excellent question. Lindsay, thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy field season to connect with us today. It was great talking with y'all. I think they're all very happy with it, too. I hope everybody enjoyed. Oh, they're gonna... <laughs> and hey, everybody here and online, thanks for tuning in to today's program. We'll be back with our paleontology team again at the end of the month on August 26th. So go ahead and mark your calendars to check in with us again and see what new discoveries they've made and how the field season is going. We'll all get updated again at the end of the month, just as they get ready to, uh, to close down the summer field season. Make sure that you are following Dr. Lindsay Zano on social media. You can follow at Expedition Live to get the latest updates on a regular basis, or at least as Lindsay's, you have cell phone service, I guess. And you can yeah. also follow <laughs> naturalsciences.org for updates on more programs and events and natural sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, Lindsay, hope you have a great rest of your Saturday. Thanks. Wish us luck, everybody. Wish us more pieces of our new dinosaur. We will keep our fingers crossed for you. Take care, Excellent. Lindsay. Peace okay, out. thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye.